All right, next we're going to go to Jamie Farrell at the U of U Seismology Department. We've got him on the phone, I believe. Jamie, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for talking with us. We are just trying to uh, break down if there's any significance to another 4.2 aftershock within just a couple of days of the one we had a, a, a few days ago. Uh, no, not really. Still an, another aftershock uh, during this sequence that started on the 18th. Um, it's located in the, in, in the same you know, region as, as all the other events, so we still consider it an aftershock. Um, you know, there, the Midas, you know, the 4.2 we had the other night, um, you know, might have changed a little bit, which um, could have, um, you know, triggered this event. Um, but they're all still considered aftershocks uh, from the 5.7. Are these, this size, we've asked this question a couple of times, but really this far out, are these sizes, especially relative to the initial shock, the initial 5.7, now, 4.2 does seem fairly significant compared to the initial 5.7 more than a month ago now. Well, keep in mind, we had, a, you know, a couple 4.6 aftershocks early in the sequence. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this seems um, a bit unusual just because it's, it's been a while since we felt a bit, you know, a relatively larger earthquake in this aftershock sequence. But, you know, a 4.2 at this point isn't necessarily out of uh, the realm of possibility. Um, it's not totally unusual, although the one that the other night, given the way that the sequence was going and dying off, um, is a little bit unexpected, but, um, you know, not totally unusual, if that makes sense. It does, and I know it's hard to make predictions, but how long now are we going to continue to experience these aftershocks since it's been one month already? Yeah, does this mean we kind of start the process over again? Uh, the the 4.2 the other night could definitely have uh, caused an increase in the number of events, um, but having events out this far is not unusual at all. I mean, some aftershock sequences last week, some last month. There are some that last years, um, depending on uh, the nature of, of the main shock and the, and the tectonic system. But um, having earthquakes out till now is, is definitely not unusual at all. So just be ready for more because that's what it sounds like. You know, I just asked uh, Joe Doherty with the emergency management if this is something that would ex be expected to change the topography at all. You know, you have pictures sometimes of after earthquakes of little cracks and things like that. Do you expect those kinds of things from that 5.7 and then some of these aftershocks? Well, there, there, there's two different things to think about here. So typically to have what we call a fault scarp on the surface. That's where the earthquake was big enough to where it ruptured up to the surface and broke the ground. You typically have to have at least a magnitude six, maybe a little bit larger, in order for the earthquake to be able to rupture all the way up to the surface. Um, that did not happen in the 5.7. Um, so all the ground cracking that we saw on that was due to what we call soft sediment deformation, to where it shakes the ground and the ground cracks because it's, it's moving a little bit. Um, it typically happens like in lake sediments or around the Great Salt Lake. The, the marina saw a lot of a lot of this stuff. Um, so that's the type of cracking that you saw from the 5.7. I wouldn't expect much from this 4.2 since it's um, significantly smaller than the 5.7. All right, from the ground cracking to the building cracking, we did get some damage with the 5.7. And I know even buildings downtown, the courthouse in Salt Lake, were trying to assess whether those cracks meant anything and were they structurally still sound, the building itself? So um, now that we've had a couple of significant aftershocks, is that something where people need to do the same thing all over again, still find out if, if their, their buildings, their homes are structurally sound, or do those cracks not mean anything? Well, I'm not an engineer, so uh, I, I don't really know the answer to that. But, you know, there has been, you know, in, when you have a, a big earthquake, and it causes some damage, you know, some buildings may be considered uh, structurally sound, then you have a few aftershocks that might kind of push it over the edge. So I don't, like I said, I'm not an engineer, so I don't know um, about that kind of stuff, but, um, you know, they would know um, whether this would be enough shaking to, to, to do that, but that's not 
my not area. Not something, not your area of expertise. Yeah. yeah. Jamie, what about this right. then? I, I, um, I know besides measuring the strength of the aftershock, which is a 4.2, you can measure the longevity, how many seconds it lasted. Do we know that info yet? I was asking Joe Doherty the same thing, but um, he, he didn't quite have that information yet. And I don't know how long it takes to get that. No, we still have to. We still have to look at the the data as a whole, and you know that really is a function. That's really a function of two things. One, of what type of uh, geology you're sitting on, whether you're sitting out in the in the valley on these old lake sediments that tend to shake longer, or if you're up on the bench where you're closer to the bedrock, that tends to shake less. Um, and also, it depends on your building, right? So the building will respond to the ground shaking, and the building will have its own what we call resonance frequency, and that might cause it to shake longer. For example, if you're downtown, up on one of the higher floors of these, of these high-rise buildings, they'll shake longer than you would feel if you're on the ground floor of that building. So there's really a lot of factors that go into how long that you feel the shaking. And we're looking uh, right now at uh, looks like another aftershock just in the last few minutes. It was less than a 2.0 right along the uh, 201 right below this uh, earlier aftershock. I'm curious how you're able to pinpoint these so quickly to find out exactly where they are. Well, we have a whole network of seismometers out that are um, constantly collecting data um, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, and they're all networked back into our, our system at the University of Utah. And that data comes in in real time. And we have a whole uh, computer system that uh, analyzes data and uh, picks times of when that uh, earthquake energy reaches that station, and then we can use that data to automatically locate and uh, determine the magnitude for these earthquakes. And then we all get alarmed uh, when that thing gets, when an earthquake gets located. And then we'll have uh, uh, trained seismologists and seismic analysts look at that and, uh, and have a, a human review that and make sure that um, it's, it's as good as possible. All right, Jamie, what you're thinking and what we're thinking about this aftershock, I'm sure, is, is a lot different. Your whole career is built around, you know, earthquakes and, and studying them and what they mean. What do you find interesting about these two quakes or even this morning's aftershock? Well, you know, for me, all, all earthquakes are interesting, right? So uh, um, this is actually what's interesting to me um, is that this has the same magnitude as uh, Tuesday night's quake. Um, but this one seems to be felt a lot more widely than Tuesday night. And um, that's something that we'll have to look into. In fact, this is the first earthquake where I live that I've actually felt since March 18th. And where uh, are you? I am up on the east bench. Okay. And uh, uh, does that mean anything? Uh, we don't know. So it's, we're, we're, you know, that's something that we'll have to look into on, on why this one was felt. Uh, it seems like this one was felt um, more widely than Tuesday night's quake, even though they're located um, in about the same area and they have the same magnitude. So it's something that we'll have to look into. Okay, and we just looked at uh, another graph that showed how many uh, smaller shocks we've had all over the state and up into Idaho recently. So, I mean, it looks like in this area, this is kind of a hotbed for movement, which we kind of understand already, but they're all over the place. This one's just kind of unique, though, it seems, because it's a populated area where a lot of people are going to feel this, it sounds like. Well, right. I mean, we definitely live in, in, in earthquake country. Um, we have lots of earthquakes every year uh, in Utah and the surrounding area. Um, this one, um, you know, the 5.7 is definitely, um, uh, um, I wouldn't say unusual, but something that we don't get all the time. Um, so it's kind of raised people's awareness. So now we're feeling all these earthquakes. We know what we're feeling. Um, and it's definitely happening in a very populated place. So uh, that's something that uh, always raises awareness as well. Jamie Farrell, a seismologist with the U of U. We so appreciate you talking with us this morning and kind of walking us through what this all means. Good information. Yeah, appreciate it.